Hello everyone and welcome back to Eric Likes Animals. I'm Eric Mahan. Thank you guys so much for listening. Today's species is going to make a pretty big splash, I think, so let's dive right in. Today we're going to be talking about the green bumphead or humphead parrotfish. So, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is related to a lot of different species of parrotfish, but today we're going to focus on specifically the green bumphead, and that is because the green bumphead is actually the largest of the parrotfish. It's actually 4.9 feet in length. The weight of these guys actually is a grand total of up to 165 pounds, or about 330 pet store goldfish. Now, I haven't done the math of actual goldfish crackers, so if anybody wants to do that math for me to figure out how many goldfish crackers these guys weigh, uh, just post it anywhere on my Facebook page or Twitter page. Anyway, going back to the bump head. Parrotfish in general are very colorful, so much so and with so much variety, even in singular species, that... It was once believed that there was 350 different types of parrotfish, but scientists have actually narrowed that down to about 60 species of parrotfish. And the reason why scientists were so confused was due to the color variations. Parrotfish, depending on the age and the sex, have many different color variations. So within one single species, it could look like there were multiple. So thanks to DNA testing and all those sort of things, they were able to narrow it down that actually out of the 350 species that they thought there were with parrotfish that currently we only know of 60. Parrotfish in general are very colorful, hence the name parrotfish. Uh, the other big characteristic of parrotfish is the fused teeth on the front of them that actually looks like a parrot beak. So with the combination of this beak-like structure and all the color variations, hence why we call them parrotfish. Now, diving back into the green bump head, these guys are, like I said, large. Other specific characteristics of them is their giant freaking forehead, <laughs> okay? Um, it looks kind of like a cartoon animation where someone whacks somebody in the head and all of a sudden the giant bump appears, all right? They have these giant freaking foreheads or it actually looks like basically a, a camel hump on their head. Besides that characteristic, they of course also have the giant beak-like structure. Um, they're kind of a greenish blue fish. They're a very stocky, well-built, thick-looking fish. Like They look like they are be a linebacker uh, in the fish community. And the only other big characteristic of them, I would say, is that they kind of have this pink strip kind of going down the front of their face, kind of going from the tip of the big bump on their head, kind of right down the middle of their face, down to kind of their chin area. <laughs> I definitely suggest checking it out because probably not the best in describing how they look, <laughs> but that's my best description I got for you guys. The green bumphead parrotfish lives in the Indian and Pacific waters, including the Great Barrier Reef. A lot of times these guys are living in lagoons and reefs, which is pretty normal for parrotfish. They also really don't go below 30 meters. They're definitely kind of the upper layer of the ocean living fish. These guys can live up to 40 years, which is a pretty long life for a fish. They only hit sexual maturity at five to eight years of age. And actually throughout their entire lifetime, parrotfish in general can change their sex multiple times. So throughout their entire life, these guys are actually able to switch between being male and female. Now, a lot of times what would happen is you would have a big group of females or a harem of females. And if there are no males available, what will happen is the larger of the females will actually start going through a transformation and actually will become a male. And this is just to encourage and keep the genetic 
population diverse because sometimes during fighting or whatever, you know, there's not a lot of males in sight for them. So also, if you're curious what I mean by harem, harem is just a group terminology that refers to having multiple females with one male. For instance, Pride of Lions is very much like a harem, like there's a lot of different females as well as one male. Now, kind of going to their namesake, bump heads, because there is a reason why they do have these big old knock-ins on them, and that is that bump head bumps are very much kind of like goat horns or bighorn sheep horns, and that it is a statement piece for the males. It is a sign of a well-fed, uh, very powerful male, the bigger the bump. Uh, also, they will actually use these bumps as kind of battling rams against each other. Uh, when males are fighting over harems or territory or anything like that, they will use them as kind of like a giant helmet to bash into each other. And this is all due to getting the chance to have the best spawning locations. And once again, spawning is just a fancy word for fish breeding, especially since it takes it outside the body for their breeding. So spawning is just the release of sperm and eggs from fish. Other animals can spawn as well, but for the most part, we normally use it when we refer to fish breeding. With the green bump head, spawning can actually happen in groups of 10 to actually hundreds. So it is pretty chaotic, especially when you have a bunch of males ramming into each other and trying to encourage females to basically come over to their section of the ocean so that they can spawn with them. But like I said, not all the time is it in giant groups like that. Sometimes it's just 10 and there's only one male. But what will happen is a male will show off and try to get the females to come over to his area. And basically the females will release the eggs and he will then kind of swim over them and fertilize them as he does. Now, what we refer to this kind of breeding with them is lek mating, which is basically a bunch of males all together fighting and dancing to try to attract the females to come over to them to spawn, which is pretty much like any dance club I've ever been to, where basically it's just a bunch of guys trying to show off their dance moves to try and pick up girls at the bar. That is the same exact way that these parrotfish do it as well. And what will happen is, just like the club, <laughs> is you'll have the more dominant male, and he'll attract a bunch of females over, and he'll vastly protect his territory and the females that are coming over. And what will happen sometimes is he will not fertilize every single egg. There are some males that are called sneaker males or streak males, <laughs> which is a great uh, terminology for it, which refers to as the more dominant parrotfish is busy fertilizing eggs. This lesser dominant male will actually sneak in real quick, release some sperm, and rush out before the dominant male has time to think, especially in these giant groups of breeding. When it's the smaller groups, that male can normally protect his females and the eggs that he's trying to fertilize a little bit easier. But in hundreds, like there's fish all over the place, all right? It's it's a pretty crazy time. He's trying to defend and also spawn all at the same time, and there's like 30 other males trying to sneak in and all that sort of stuff. Like, it's hard to keep track of it all. So the dominant male is not the only one that breeds. you got these sneaker males that will actually kind of swoop in real quick, fertilize some eggs, and beeline it out of there before the dominant male even knows what's going on. But being the dominant male still has a lot of its benefits in that you are normally in that spot. You normally have the best <laughs> position, <laughs> so to speak, to fertilize the eggs. But one female could get fertilized by three, four, even five different males, technically. And then, like I said, it will take five to eight years for those little tiny eggs then to develop and then to finally reach sexual maturity and become full-fledged adult green humphead parrotfish. Now, let's focus in on another main aspect of the parrotfish, and that is its beak. Parrotfish technically don't really have a beak. What it actually is, is their front teeth are actually kind of fused together. So 
when you look at the many different types of parrotfish out there, sometimes it looks a little more beak-like. Honestly, I kind of think it looks like a pair of really big, really badly done, fake, goofy front teeth, kind of like almost like cartoon big teeth sometimes. And what that does is it actually helps them with what they eat and what most parrotfish eat. Okay, so we're focusing on what most parrotfish eat right now. And that is it's kind of a specialized set of teeth that actually scrapes algae off of coral, which is very hard. All right, it's a very tough material coral. With that tough material, they kind of need a very strong set of teeth to be able to get there and scrape off all the algae. Now, as they're doing it, they're also eating a lot of calcium carbonate, which is what makes up the outer shell of what we'll refer to as coral skeletons. Now, the unique thing about the bump head is that being so large, it's very hard to scrape off the little individual pieces of algae on coral. So they will actually take giant chunks of live coral. So they actually, unlike most parrotfish that kind of just scrape off little bits of algae and maybe just like a little bit of like the outer layer of the coral, these guys are known to actually take out giant chunks of coral when they're eating. The interesting thing of what happens to that coral after it is eaten by the bump heads is it gets digested and obviously it comes out as poop. And do you know what coral poop actually is for most areas? It's those beautiful, white, sandy beaches. That's right. If you guys love sticking your toes in those white, sandy beaches, a decent bit of what is there is actually parrotfish poop. So over, obviously, the thousands and thousands of years, what has happened is these parrotfish eat all this coral and actually then poop out that fine powdery sand. Most sand found in reefs and in those very tropical beach areas and the white dusty kind of like light sand is actually parrotfish poop. Sorry if that grosses you out as you walk on the beach. But you might be thinking, yeah, but how much of this sand could actually be parrotfish poop? And I gotta tell you a decent bit. One bump head parrotfish can eat up to five tons of calcium carbonate in a year. One bump head fish could produce upwards of five tons of sand in a year. So that's where all this extra sand comes from. And it's even been stated that some of the sandy bars near a lot of the tropical reefs are actually just basically giant piles of parrotfish shit. So Think about that the next time when you see those pristine shots of beautiful, tropical, white, sandy beaches. And just know that that is literally just a basically a giant picture of parrotfish shit. Which I think more places should do. Just imagine a postcard that says, come to Pennsylvania, and all that was on it was a big old pile of cow shit. Makes you want to go there, right? Now, like I said... They need a very specialized set of teeth to do this. So as I stated before, their teeth are actually fused together and are basically what helps them break it off. Now, other parts that help them out is that they actually have two sets of teeth. So they have kind of that front set that you see that helps break off the chunks. But after they break off the chunks, they can't just simply swallow it. They actually have a second set of teeth in their throats. And that set of teeth are basically giant plate-like teeth that act as a giant grinder that then helps break down that coral into kind of more the softer, sandy beach kind. Their whole body is basically like a conveyor belt that takes coral and creates sand. The other special feature of those front teeth, because as you can imagine, as strong as those teeth are, coral's pretty strong as well and their front teeth get worn down very quickly. And just like rodents, these guys' teeth are constantly growing. So they're basically always having a beautiful set of teeth, no matter what, that's constantly growing to keep them able to munch away on as much coral as they want. And actually, a lot of times, bump heads will travel in groups of hundreds 
and they will travel multiple kilometers in a day. By doing this, they shape the reefs and are almost like gardeners to the reefs themselves, very much like how elephants shape the forest that they live in. Yes, you might think that they're very destructive, but actually it's extremely helpful because what is happening is that the bump head actually keeps balance in these coral reefs. A lot of times they like to focus in on corals that are very fast growing, like those are the types of corals that they focus on. So what they are in turn doing is making sure that these specific corals that grow very fast do not overtake the rest of the reef because it's very important for diversity to have as many different corals growing in those reefs because each set of corals has its own unique adaptation or contribution to these reefs and that will help out multiple species of animals. So without these bump heads, these reefs just really wouldn't survive very well. Real quick, let's jump into coral because I keep talking about it and very much coral is such an important factor in these fish life. And a lot of people don't actually understand what coral is. So I'll give you kind of like the quick the quick intro to what coral is. And the number one thing I got to tell you what coral is that always shocks people is coral is a animal. It's not a plant. It's actually considered an animal. And that is because it is alive and it grows. But coral do not actually make their own food. Like a plant, it does root down. It does embed itself into the ocean floor. It's not like it can move around, but it does have parts of it that technically do. Because within the coral, there are actually tiny little tentacle-like arms that reach out and actually grab tiny bits of food as it flows by. So that's kind of one of the main ways that coral will actually eat. The other is that it is a symbiosis relationship with algae. So there are types of algae that will actually live within coral, and that algae has basically a safe, comfortable spot to stay and grow, and in return will actually help feed the coral itself, which, yes, is a pretty big loophole. Coral doesn't photosynthesize, so it's not a plant. It's an animal. But the algae that it has a symbiosis relationship with photosynthesizes for it, and it uses the energy the algae photosynthesizes from. The last thing that I'll say real quick about coral as well is a lot of people don't understand that a coral is not technically one creature, but actually multiple tiny creatures. When you look at a coral and I'm telling you it's an animal, don't look at the coral as like it is one singular animal, but actually made up of hundreds, maybe thousands of tiny animals. So technically, one coral is really hundreds of coral making that one structure. A lot of times these are referred to as polyps. And what happens there is those polyps are the ones that produce the calcium carbonate and create those different coral structures we see. All right, I think that's a good stopping point for corals. If you want to know more, I definitely suggest checking it out because that's just very, very basic information on coral and gives you a better understanding on what these bump heads are eating. And with all that delicious coral in their bellies, the next step is taking a nap. And when these guys go to bed, they have a very interesting method to do that. For you see, when it's time to go to sleep, they actually will produce a mucus snot bed for themselves. So best way to describe it is it looks like a giant clear jello snot bubble that they produce around themselves when they go to bed at night. A lot of different scientists argue on exactly what the mucus bed is for. Some say it smells bad to keep predators their way. Others say that mucus mold actually is a protective layer that keeps aquatic pests away because yes, even though they're in the ocean, there are still invertebrates out there that go after larger organisms, very much like how ticks will jump on people, dogs, and deer. They have pests as well in the ocean, and specifically, there are aquatic isopods that will hitch a ride on them and try and chew them and nibble on them. So they're thinking that the mucus 
keeps those away since they're normally staying still when they're sleeping versus during the day where they're swimming around and isopods and stuff would have a much harder time hitching a ride. The other one that isn't as likely as the other ones, but I'll still mention that some people are thinking the mucus bed is for, is that it's actually a warning system that their main predators, a shark or a moray eel, would hit the membrane before they would reach the fish itself, and that would give it kind of a warning sign that something is about to attack it. However, not as accurate for most scientists because moray eels and sharks move so quickly that they think that it would not be a good enough time system that the shark would probably already have the fish in its mouth by the time the fish realized that the shark hit the membrane. But I wanted to keep it in since it's still out there. However, I would say that the other two, the stinkiness to keep predators away and also the membrane to protect itself from invertebrates at night, are the more plausible reasons for the mucous membrane. Now, as I said, their main predators are sharks and moray eels. Unfortunately, they are also having to deal with people, of course. You know, <laughs> I think every single animal has to deal with people due to pollution and overfishing because there are people out there that do eat these guys, um, especially because it's a very big fish. So that's going to provide a lot of meat for many different people. The other big thing too, and this kind of goes with most reefs, and actually it's considered one of the most damaging to the ocean, is called bottom trawling, which is the fishing practice where people will drop a big heavy net and actually drag it across the bottom of the seafloor. And they might not even be fishing for parrotfish, but they would be considered bycatch where it's not like a net can only catch a certain type of fish. Basically, whatever is in its way will get caught up. And sometimes these guys will get caught up in the bottom trawling. But also one of the bigger issues is that this method of fishing basically devastates anything that's on the ocean floor and will actually break and destroy coral. And coral is not a very fast-growing organism. When you look at these reefs, these are thousands of years of time and patience and growing. They are not very fast-growing things. Even the fast corals are not very fast. And destroying that is like clear-cutting a whole forest that is going to take hundreds of years to regrow back into what it was. So these are all kind of main factors that are devastating parrotfish populations. Actually, under the IUCN Red List, which I've talked about in other podcast episodes, they are listed as vulnerable population decreasing. Now, what I just stated with the pollution, overfishing, and all that sort of stuff, definitely a big factor in it. But actually, I'm going to focus in on one specific thing that I didn't actually talk about yet, and that is the effect of coral bleaching. So no one is actually going out and bleaching these corals. What is actually happening is there are mass die-offs of coral, and when a coral dies, it loses its color, and the only thing that is left is that coral skeleton, which is just calcium carbonate, which is very white. So all of a sudden, all these colorful corals become ghostly white. Now, there are two main factors that are causing this. Number one is global climate change. During warmer water temps, this will have the algae exit out of the coral itself because it is also trying to survive, and all of a sudden, the coral is no longer habitable for it. So it will leave, and thus the coral will lose its main source of food, and eventually the animals inside would die. The other main thing is one that a lot of people are starting to talk about now, which are microplastics. And this is being caused by the plastics that have been sitting in the ocean, like water bottles, tires, all those kind of things for all of these years, are breaking down into these almost microscopic pieces. Now, they are not degrading away because it takes thousands and thousands of years. They're just breaking down into smaller, more dangerous pieces because what is happening is animals are breathing it in without even knowing it. And for these corals, these microplastics are about the same size as zooplankton. Now, zooplankton 
is one of the things that the coral eat. If you remember, I also said one of their feeding methods is having those little tentacles come out and catch little bits of things flying by. And in this case, zooplankton. Unfortunately for them, they are picking up on all these microplastics. And well, just like us, it is not good to eat plastic. Now with them, it is so bad that it will actually cause the coral to become stressed and then thus the algae leaves and once again it will die because those plastics are still very toxic. It has actually been said that there are more pieces of plastic in our ocean than stars in our entire galaxy, which is a lot. Also, scientists currently believe that in the last 10 years we have actually lost 14% of our corals. 14% doesn't seem very big when you look at percentages, but let me tell you how big that actually is. They are saying that 14% of our corals is like losing the Great Barrier Reef within 10 years. The Great Barrier Reef currently is covering 133,000 square miles. As a reference, New York City is only 302.6 square miles. And the state of California is 163 thousand six hundred ninety six square miles so we lost just under the state of california amount of corals across the world now i'm not going to leave you with the doom and gloom i'm going to tell you one of the many solutions that are available obviously the global climate change is obviously the getting away from fossil fuels and all that but we've touched on that on a couple other podcasts what i'm going to fixate on is the microplastics now There are very, very, very well-developed biodegradable plastics now. And unfortunately for most people, it doesn't seem widely available in your local stores. Now, number one, you could ask your stores to start supplying them and also maybe encourage them to really emphasize how well this plastic is and that it's biodegradable versus the other product that is choking out the sea. Another option, of course, and maybe one of the most convenient for most people, is Amazon has all these biodegradable products online. You can buy plastic biodegradable silverware and plates and cups and all that sort of stuff, and you can even set up times. I am not sponsored by Amazon, real quick. Now, this is a very small thing that people can do, and a lot of people think that conservation, the greatest impacts, are making giant sweeping changes in their life to help out the environment, and that is very great. But the main thing that will help us is not major changes in individual people's lives, but small changes in many individual lives, because switching to those biodegradable products is going to encourage other companies to seek biodegradable options. Great example, the biggest industry of plastics out there, it feels like, Legos. They said in the not so near future, they are going to be switching that all their Legos will be biodegradable. And if they can do it, so can many others. And it seems like such a small little change, buying biodegradable silverware versus plastic, that can make the change that will save the corals, thus saving the green hump-headed parrotfish. And that is the green hump-headed parrotfish. Thank you guys so much for listening again. Don't forget to check out my Facebook and Twitter page at Eric Likes Animals. Also, if you don't do social media, you can always just email me at ericlikesanimals at gmail.com if you have any questions, concerns, or reviews. Also, you could just simply let me know if you are somebody that loves math and figured out exactly how many goldfish crackers equals out to one green pump-headed parrotfish. But until next time, see ya!